Ever watch old commercial compilations from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s and just turn your brain off? Ever watch them with your brain on? I have. I've been cooking this one for some time now and I found some pretty wild stuff, especially from one of the biggest animation studios in the United States. Some of the subject matter is a little intense, so if you're upset by conversations about S.A., this is a heads up. Otherwise, enjoy. This video is about advertisements that feature romantic relations, let's call them for now, and later I'm going to talk about Pixar and how they made a commercial in the 1990s where glasses of Fresca commit forced romantic relations on each other. If you're not already watching this video on YouTube, it helped me out a great deal if you'd watch this video on my YouTube page as I'm trying to build an audience there. And if you like my work and you want to help it keep going, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. That's Nicholas Nameless at both YouTube and Patreon. Thank you. Before I get into all this Pixar mess, I'm going to take a shot at parsing out how we got there. So first, some greater context. People have been making images of each other's junk since we figured out how to make art. The oldest known piece of erotic art is also the first known representation of a human figure, the Venus of Holofell's cave in Germany from around 60,000 years ago. And by the time we could make moving images, we were still doing that. People have been making advertisements for a long ass time as well, though not nearly as long as images of people's junk. The oldest known ads were jingles played by candy makers on bamboo flutes to attract customers in China around 3,000 years ago. The first known instance of sex in advertising, I'm just going to say it now, this is ridiculous, is another Venus of sorts, this time printed on packs of pearl rolling tobacco in 1871, over 150 years ago, in the United States. Societal norms around these sorts of things can vary wildly from product to product and era to era. You'd be unlikely to see a topless woman printed on rolling tobacco today, but 48 years later in 1919, an ad for deodorant called Odorono couldn't use the word armpit or underarm, so they said, within the curve of a woman's arm. And it was still scandalous at the time. People were disgusted. It was also wildly successful. As attitudes shift and consumers become more savvy, advertisers step their game up to stay more relevant. Opinion polls, market research, ad psychology, consumer engineering, creative waste, neuromarketing, cool hunting, taste clusters. Taste clusters. I know those sound like meaningless buzzwords, but they're really the arsenal corporations use to get our attention so they can lay eggs in our brain in the form of commercials. It's like people only do things because they get paid. And that's just really sad. They got us all figured out. They showed us the precise ways in which every part of our lives and ourselves were bad inside and out. And then they offered us countless products to solve those problems piece by piece, dollar by dollar. Sex isn't just a sales tactic, it's multiple sales tactics. And since we live in a patriarchal society, these tactics are usually employed to uphold patriarchal standards. Sex in advertising is almost inextricable from sexism in advertising, and often when you read a critique of it, it's over something more overt, like the bro-y 2000s era Carl's Jr. and Axe body spray type ads that grossly objectified women in order to appeal to immature men. Those kinds of ads deserve every bit of scrutiny they get, but I want to talk about some less in your face ads because a lot of them just sort of washed over us without anyone clocking how truly strange, awkward, and at times disturbing they were, especially when the products had no obvious sex appeal. The problem isn't sex, it's the culture's pornographic attitude towards sex, the trivialization of sex. And nowhere is sex more trivialized than in advertising, where by definition it is used to sell everything. Advertisers associated so many different products with sex for so long and kept heightening that idea in order to keep our attention that people became numb to it. Pixar were masters of horny for no reason advertising, but I gotta set the tone with this Red Baron ad from the year 2000. A lady makes a frozen pizza, then has a daydream about dancing with the Red Baron from the pizza box. Then when she comes to, there he is, standing behind her, and he takes his pilot goggles off, and she plays with her hair, and they both have a look on their face, like they're about to go to pound town, just left pound town. Ultimately, the most you could call this ad is suggestive, but what's being suggested is pretty clearly the ghost of a German World War I fighter pilot and a very lonely woman 
wearing out their knees while her pizza burns in the oven. A spokesperson for Red Baron described their pizza mascot as an aviator personifying strength and romance. So I guess they're leaning into the romance novel vibe he gives off. I mean, the real Red Baron didn't look anything like that. He was a German enemy pilot, which is weird, but frozen pizza brands are just kind of violent, you know? Tombstone, um, jacks. I feel like frozen pizza is just not sexy, and most it's what happens after sex, but a 30-second time-traveling romance epic about frozen pizza. That is the tone I wish to set at this moment. Tombstone has an ad that alludes to sex too, but sadly, there's no fantasy element this time. We can put on some music, heat up the pizza, and who knows? Is it a tombstone pizza? No. What kind of guy do you think I am? Will you hold out for Tombstone? Tombstone, the official pizza of abstinence. He's about to get lit up once he posts that on the Am I the Asshole Reddit. But unfortunately, I gotta stop talking about pizza and start talking about Pixar. In the early 90s, before Pixar could make movies, they made commercials. Not just animations, but whole concepts, like an ad firm. And since Pixar didn't really have that whole human representation thing unlocked just yet, it's a computer's idea of what a baby looks like. A lot of these ads feature anthropomorphized inanimate objects. Stuff like swashbuckling mouthwash bottles, Mexican food ingredients in an old Wild West town, and constipated water sprinklers that need brand cereal. Also, a bunch of African artifacts dancing because they smell McDonald's. Have you had your break today? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and take this personally. Some of these objects act out romantic partnerships. They raise children together. They go dancing together. Orange met peach, mm -hmm. and peach met mango. And all together, they started to tango. Okay, maybe the tone that I have set for this video might insinuate that those pieces of fruit became some kind of fruit thruple. But, f insinuation at this point, here's two coffee machines banging it out to I'm in the mood for love. The coffee machines used in more fine restaurants nationwide proudly present their offspring. Coffee machines doing it. It's like that Beck video for sex laws where all the kitchen ingredients and appliances are frantically humping each other. Just a reminder, music videos are also advertisements. This coffee machine ad was deranged, but at least it was consensual. The reason I made this video is a Fresca ad Pixar made called Giggling Straws, despite none of the straws giggling. It starts with two glasses of ice, one with a yellow straw and one with a lavender straw. The glass with the lavender straw has Fresca poured in it, and the yellow straw eyes the glass of Fresca with the lavender straw up and down as provocative muted trumpet music plays. It also has no sugar. Just as the lavender straw is becoming aware of what's happening, the yellow straw sucks the end of the lavender straw, gulping down the fresca for itself. Then, just in case we didn't already get the picture, a much larger glass with a much larger red straw in it stares down the yellow straw, who is now shrinking away in terror. This was considered light humor in 1993. Fresca, the tasteful alternative. Then, they have the nerve to call themselves tasteful. It's more like they put the in grapefruit. I'm sorry, but I feel like if you think I'm overreacting, you can't be particularly media literate, because looking at this now, all I can think is how incredible it is that they told this story without words or human figures, just audio and visual cues we'd all understand. We know that lavender is a feminine coated color. We know that the muted trumpet cue and the look up and down means attraction. What's your hurry, boy? We know that males are expected to be the aggressors. And just look at the way the lavender straw is animated. No agency, like the other two straws, it's completely passive. Also, we know that red means danger. If anyone ever tells you that red culture is a myth, show them chuckling straws. Now, they'll probably still deny it because they're not good people, but I don't know, give it a shot. That ad was pretty clearly an homage to a stop-motion Perrier ad from 1989, done by Ardman Animations, you know, the Wallace and Gromit people. In the Perrier ad, a bottle of lemon Perrier with a yellow straw and a bottle of lime flavor with what I'm assuming is a green straw, this recording is very old, so it looks gray, but based on this print ad, it was probably green. This image is still watermarked, by the way, that's an ad on top of an ad right there. But in the Perrier ad, the green straw comes on a little too aggressive out the gate, adjusts its approach, and the yellow straw meets it halfway. They embrace they get horizontal, 
and the lime bottle starts to bubble. Now we know the yellow straw is the female coated one this time because there's an opera duet in the background and the woman starts singing once the yellow straw starts to dig the green straw. Also green is the aggressor, the female orgasm isn't prioritized, and of the two colors in question, yellow is the lighter. They're not exactly pink and blue, but Daisy and Luigi, April and the Turtles, the Green and Yellow Rangers, Dipsy and Lala, not that the Teletubbies having gender ever made any sense, but you get it. There's a precedent, literally set for children to understand. Just like the Fresca ad, even though it's only straws and glass, we all know what's going on here from constant conditioning. It's for sure weird, but the yellow straw has agency. It willingly makes a choice, whereas in the Fresca ad, that's a salt, brother. That's a salt, brother. It's worth noting that when Pixar did work for French markets, they were far less subtle with these kinds of implications. The prequel to A Bug's Life is an ant with tits that sold Volkswagens. Pixar was an animation studio moonlighting as an ad firm, which is appropriate because those two industries are well known for being misogynistic boys clubs. Not that that's a unique trait for an industry to have. In 2017, Pixar got called out in the Me Too movement for sexual harassment and discrimination of female employees. Most notoriously, former chief creative officer John Lasseter, director of Toy Stories 1 and 2, A Bug's Life, and Cars 1 and 2. Lasseter was said to have a, quote, hard time controlling himself around young women. This was the explanation given to graphic designer Cassandra Smallchick when she was uninvited from all weekly art department meetings for Cars 2. Smallchick was not the only victim, and Lasseter was not the only offender. You can read her accounts of what happened in Variety and in more detail on Medium. Though Lasseter was fired from Pixar in June of 2018, he became the head of Skydance Animation less than a year later, where he now makes cartoons for Apple, Pixar's previous owner. The Pixar commercials I've covered in this video come from a DVD called Made in Point Richmond, a gift for Pixar employees to document the work done in Point Richmond, California, before moving their offices to Emeryville, California. Hey, that's me. Once thought to be lost media, Made in Point Richmond not only includes commercials and shorts produced by the studio, but also home movie style sketches made for holiday parties. Most of these videos are just innocuous office in-jokes. Frank, I am the president. But there's also stuff like gratuitous shots of swimsuit models in the 89 Christmas video. There's a video where Lasseter is asking people on the street if they know about Pixar. And Pixar, Pixar, that's a make of watch. After he asks a hairdresser, the cameraman creepily lingers on her walking away, even after Lasseter has already begun talking to another person. And most disturbingly, there's this bizarre video of Pixar bosses like Lasseter and Ed Catmull at a software convention intercut with a spinning 3D x-ray of a woman's pelvis set to Bongo Bongo by Steve Miller. There might be some kind of explanation for this I'm missing, but not a good one. These are glimpses into a workplace culture that produces an ad where a violent traumatic crime is played for laughs. But I don't only fault Pixar here. I mean, they didn't exactly sneak one past us. This was an ad for a nationally recognized brand that aired all over the country to no reaction. I have to ask how much basic decency has eroded from a society that can just casually watch that. Though I understand that a great deal of social programming got us all to that point. And since when else am I going to talk about this stuff? Here's a prime example of social programming and advertising. I think the ultimate anti-Pixar ad is one of the most famous ads of all time. 2002's Lamp, directed by Spike Jones for Ikea. A desk lamp, the anthropomorphized object Pixar is so famous for, it is now their logo, gets placed on a curb while it rains and sappy music plays. Similar to the Fresca ad, we even get shots of the lamp's perspective as it's ripped away from the safety of its home and subjected to watching its own replacement shining in the front window. Then a Swedish man enters the frame and mocks you for falling for these simple editing tricks. Many of you feel bad for this lamp. That is because you're crazy. It has no feelings. And the new one is much better. The message is bullshit. We see very clearly from the beginning of the ad that the lamp works fine and doesn't need to be replaced. But that's the point. The idea, according to one of the people who came up with the ad, was to get American consumers to chase furniture style trends the same way they did clothing style trends instead of clinging to dated items out of sentimental value. And this was evil. 
Some people even called it out at the time. It's one of the oldest grifts in the book, and it's one I already mentioned earlier, consumer engineering. Consumer engineering is basically when a company creates demand with some sort of update to the product. It could be improved performance, it could be a new colorway, it could be an obscene amount of razor blades, or it could be that this is the new one, and do you really want to be seen with the old one? You know, the iPhone thing. But LAMP isn't legendary for its messaging, it's legendary for its delivery. There was this Sprite ad from 1996 with Grant Hill from the Detroit Pistons that also changed the game in its time because it openly joked about how much they paid him to do the ad. The only drink with that cool, crisp, refreshing taste. Falsely reassuring the consumer that they're all in on this joke together. In LAMP, you know the joke is on you. It sets you up to knock you down, and the knock you down part is the actual sales pitch. It's like it's negging you into buying in. The anthropomorphization in Pixar ads is used to make you want to identify with the product, but LAMP wants you to identify with the concept of newness. They made a sequel to LAMP in 2018 that seeks to correct the original's mistakes and gives the LAMP a happy ending in order to send a positive message about recycling. Many of you feel happy for this lamp. That's not crazy. Reusing things is much better. It's all very nice, but unfortunately in comparison to the original, it just feels like another commercial. In recent years, there have been a lot of ads attempting to reconcile with the many sins of the past because once again, the attitudes have shifted. We're all trying to deprogram from what these people have been doing to our minds for generations. And in order to stay relevant this time, they've started making bold political statements. One of the most high profile examples of these ads is the Gillette quote short film, We Believe, The Best a Man Can Be, from 2019. This ad had everything. Rowdy teenage boys blasting through an old Gillette ad on their way to bully some kid like NWA bursting through the I Have a Dream banner and the Express Yourself video. Another reminder that music videos are ads. Endless row of men with their arms crossed grilling corn. A sitcom with a loud white man and a black maid and he's aggressively pretending to... Then we get a wall of Me Too news clips, followed by men correcting this behavior. A man halts the unruly mob of teen bullies. A dad steps off the grill and stops two kids from fighting. The audience stops laughing at the show. A better future is secured, and so on. Misogyny is an incredibly multifaceted issue, and the Too Many Blades people attempted to cover as many facets of that issue as they possibly could in a minute and 35 seconds. It's trying to do too much, but that's the point. The ad wasn't only made to attract women or progressive liberals to the brand. It was also made to trigger conservatives into complaining about it in the press and online. Oh, I made you proud to be a man, and that was the problem, unfortunately. Can't be proud to be a man anymore. If some conservative talking head now hates your product and expresses that hatred in the media, great. That person has now made their own little ad for your progressive liberal consumer base. The hope is you'll see it and say, if this idiot hates it, then I love it. It worked just as well for that Nike ad with Colin Kaepernick from a few months earlier, and it would work years later for Bud Light. Never mind that Gillette charges women more money for ladies' razors and shaving cream, widely referred to as the pink tax. Also, it's not on Gillette's YouTube anymore. It served its purpose at the time, but now its news cycle is over, and they'd like you all to forget about it. Thank you very much. The silver lining in all this is that a decision has been made. The corporations are as unethical as ever, but... They've decided that the image they want to convey is now one of diversity and inclusion. Because at the end of the day, every kind of person still needs to buy things. And that is better than glasses of soda taking advantage of each other. Like, no matter where we go from here, no matter how much people complain, I don't think we're ever going back to the Fresca days, and that's a positive. Fresca? No, thank you. All this researching ads has gotten me thinking a lot about self-promotion, and that's never really been my bag, so I'm still learning. I don't have any sponsors, I'm monetized on TikTok, but I can't make any money there because I don't make my videos in their app. That's one of the things I just learned. I set up a Patreon, and it's in need of patrons. I'm still growing, and things are definitely shaky right now, but I have faith things are going to work out. I'm good at this, and the work is beginning to speak for itself. I got nearly a million views on TikTok. I wish that that paid out, but I am grateful for the exposure. The best I can do currently is pass my hat around at the end of my little lectures. So if you want to see things get even better here, subscribe to my YouTube. I have a Patreon with three very low tiers of $1, 3 and $5. 
Whatever you can do helps. Uh, usually I end my videos with a relevant music or audio clip, but I've decided that until I see some real movement with this thing, I'm ending my videos with one song and one song only. <laughs> Hit a fi kill me, hundred dollar bill now 